inspired to do architecture because of this potential that I discovered as a young man that architecture had the power to frame the social context and to edify and empower communities in profound ways. And in realizing that and in studying architecture, I realized that I wanted to practice as much as possible in the public realm and to be in the most democratic arena to inspire and influence the greatest amount of people. Um, for me, architecture is one of those beautiful art forms that continually has to be remade, continually has to be refined for every generation. It's not as though we just make one architecture and then that's it. It has to be recalibrated. And so this really is at the heart of why we work. And the idea um, of sort of really making sure that we are bringing as much knowledge into the experience of architecture is central to how my, me and myself and my studio work. We use, you know, the knowledge that we know from working in the US, the knowledge that we know and use from working in Europe to try and create a diversity in our knowledge base that really gives the most exceptional, we believe, uh, products to our uh, clients and to our communities. A lot of the initial work and still at the base of the, the foundation of the practice is to make visible those forces, communities, institutions that are invisible in our world. And it's not the formal structures, but it's the idea of understanding that as citizens in any community, you sort of enter a contract to be good to each other, to be supportive of each other. And that means that there is your private role in your house, which is your private realm, but you, there is your public role. And that's your, you know, the things you do, you vote, you act, act on things to kind of create edification opportunities for yourself and for the generations that are to come after you. So we are sort of custodians, not just of the world that we live in, the way we want to see it for ourselves, but also custodians of making a future for generations who haven't even been born yet. You know, I always say in my studio, yes, we're, you know, I'm an employee, but you're sort of entering a sort of vocation. <laughs> you're kind of entering a group of people who are passionate about ideas in the world, about our public life, and want a certain uh, equality that actually brings benefit to everyone. And passionately believe that in that equality, we actually make a much, much better world than we can if we don't do that. And it's, it's not a statement, it's a belief. So this way of working and trying to kind of navigate how to create spaces that are democratic across all members of society, all genders, disenfranchised as well as, you know, those that are very uh, fortunate is really a critical thing that we're always shifting. And what's really amazing is that in the history of architecture, this idea of democratizing shifts and changes. You know, in the 18th century, it was about making palaces for everyone. It was about introducing Greek temples as symbols of knowledge. You know, that was the 18th century because we were moving from a kind of medieval uh, period, a, a renaissance that happened in Europe, and a certain sense that that was an enlightenment that needed to happen around the world to kind of quote history. But those, those symbols are very important historical models, but mean different things now they start to kind of form different messages. So we need as architects, just as we transformed the world in the 1800s, in the 1900s, in the 20th century, at the beginning of the 21st century, here we go again. So I have to say that um, Winter Park is, is really punching so high up because really what is happening with the project that I think is so powerful is that another prototype, another version of what the library has evolved already in the last 20 years is being tested right in Winter Park. And what I mean by that is that the library as a campus of knowledge. So we're moving from the object uh, building or the kind of what I call the kind of infrastructure of knowledge to the space of knowledge. And that is really what we're trying to prototype in Winter Park because of the opportunity of the scenario. We're making a space where knowledge is uh, knowledge and community facilities are being brought together in a cluster to make a sort of little village, a hamlet of knowledge. This is so unique. I don't know anywhere, short of a library on a, a sort of a campus on a university, where that kind of clustering of knowledge in the public realm has happened. And that's why I'm so excited about what's happening in Winter Park. It's been a wonderful challenge, but also a big learning curve for, for us too, to learn how to make buildings in a tropical environment. You know, in terms of the structure, being able to deal with hurricane proofing, et cetera, dealing with, 
you know, things very simple like just termite proofing and worrying about the ground condition. If the uh, alligators, it's swamp, <laughs> and then the sun is much, much stronger. So shade is coveted everywhere. Uh, trees and landscape are coveted. What I wanted to also do was to make within the form to you know, use investigations that I'd already been testing, but to, to exaggerate them even more to see if one could make not a form with subforms, as in you know, a building with a canopy structure that interconnects, which is the natural thing that happens, it's blocks with you know, eaves or freestanding canopies. But somehow if we could make the forms actually become both canopy and building form as one sort of idea. So in a way, the buildings are like buildings within buildings. The outer shells splay out uh, very dramatically and almost touch and almost create a kind of, you know, when you're in the spaces in between that, a sort of sense of an interior because um, you look up and you have these slices of sky, but you are very much in shade. Something that I do in my work, this idea of understanding the kind of airflow and the and the and the and the way in which we can climatically reduce the temperature, and you know those spaces are going to be five or six degrees cooler than the outside uh, area, so they're dramatic in terms of outside temperature, in terms of the body's sort of relationship to sweat and things like that. So they become, as it were, the joining spaces in this project, the atrium for the for the program. So really, the investigation really is to see if we can use the buildings to create this third space, which is the joining between all three of them to create a public sort of shaded cool space um, that becomes an inside outside space. Uh, and that's something I'm very fascinated by. So this is doing it with proximity and geometry and, and form. You know, it's sort of interesting. Um, it became very fascinated by this idea of uh, vaulting spaces as a way to differentiate it from sort of flat commercial spaces, which are very functional and very much about, you know, utility and just kind of doing the best efficient things, which you see typically in office buildings. We wanted these buildings to have a certain kind of um, distinction in their profile that would really signify to anybody entering that this was a special room for the community. And so this idea of creating um, a series of rooms, what I'm calling public rooms, that really will make people feel that they are in something that's for them, something that will actually shift the way in which people see the spaces and use the spaces in a very dramatic way. I think that if you talk to people now, when you talk about a vaulted space or an art space, they think of ruins only. Maybe it's a trip to Italy or somewhere like that, or an old cathedral or something like that. And we wanted to bring back that incredible sort of audacity of those buildings and their beautiful sections to create these beautiful shapes into something as everyday as we believe a library should be. It should be as everyday as just going down to use the park. It should be that infrastructure that really supports the way in which you grow in your community or you mature in your community or you contribute to your community. And it becomes an infrastructure that really is there to help that public life. You know, MLK, um, Martin Luther King really, you know, was very much about the empowerment of communities through knowledge through you know, the, uh, the, the sort of emancipation of your condition, through the, uh, the access to knowledge um, as a way to kind of empower yourself. So in a way, we're sort of building a monument to his ideals of being able to democratically give all citizens very good infrastructure, very good knowledge access, very good community support, great spaces to listen, to discuss, to debate. So I've been working with libraries for 20 years now. The internet has been a huge impact on the way in which we do see libraries. Libraries post-war were about getting the Encyclopedia Britannica and as many books as you could into every community to empower and edify. And academic libraries, which are universities, etc., are all about having the back catalogs. But a community library is very different. It's about having the essential things that support those communities in the right concentrations but it's also about offering all the opportunities that the sort of ritual of going to a library has now afforded communities. It's where you do lifelong learning. It's where you have flexible spaces for teaching programs, you know, and also just spaces that are differentiated to just being hushed at a desk, you know, with shelves all around you, that traditional image of a library. You want kids to be able to sit on the floor, sit on steps, be outside on the Wi-Fi, working and thinking about ideas. That's how we are now working in our world. So, we want the, the, the library to reflect that, especially within architecture that's for, for communities, for the public. 
I think that it's important to have, you know, the history of architecture and all that sort of professionalism, but the humility to be able to make something that comes from the place. I think it's very important that architects have humility when dealing with public projects to be able to listen to the discourse, to be able to listen to different views. And, you know, it's, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. It's very tough. And sometimes it sort of implodes, you know, and it kind of reforms again. And uh, we're able to then find consensus and to find where we agree and how we can grow things. These are very important things at the formal, at the formal edge as well as the community uh, edge. And for me, there's engagement with things that emanate from a place is very, very foundational to the way I make all my work. It's not just even community or public work. It's really for me that there's a kind of humility that has to be had in the, in the honor of being given uh, a public commission, um, which will help define a community and define the communities that to come. But as I said, right at the beginning of my talk, it is something completely unique. This has not happened anywhere. It hasn't happened on any library projects that I've done that there is an investment in a public infrastructure as a campus of knowledge, a space of knowledge beyond a single object building. This is a clustering of a place to be edified in a beautiful bucolic park, which is about edification and sustenance. So they're both resuscitative. One is mental resuscitation, the other one's a physical resuscitation, and they work as a kind of dialectic, a double that really replenish the public life of the citizen. The library is no longer just a space for books. It is a place of the community. That is what the library has transformed into. We're making a campus. We're making a, a village of knowledge. And it's in this beautiful space and it's powerful.